one of the key questions here is how warm is it going to get from a certain amount of greenhouse buildup, and and where do you kind of come in now? That's the climate sensitivity. How much the world will warm if you double the pre-industrial CO2 concentration, and the system comes to new equilibrium. We're almost there. It's the zeroth order important quantity. If it's small, then we have a small problem. If it's large, we have a huge problem. And we've been determining this not by models, but from the observed temperature changes since the mid 19th century. And uh, we come up with values on the order of about two degrees Celsius, which is on the low side of the estimates that have been made since roughly uh, 1988. So that is actually very good news because that allows us uh, a little bit of breathing room and a little more leisurely phase out of greenhouse gases than if the climate sensitivity were at the high end of the range, somewhere up around four and a half or five degrees Celsius. So the, the first paper we uh, have published or will publish is uh, determining the causes of the climate change and in so doing we determine the climate sensitivity. The causes of the uh, observed temperature change, uh, climate contrarians argue that it's due to natural variations in the climate, and there are natural variations in the climate, one of which I discovered in a nature paper in 1994. It's an oscillation in the temperature over the North Atlantic with a period of 65 to 70 years, which confounded our understanding of the observed temperature changes. And uh, so this paper we have determined that the largest contributor to temperature change since the mid-19th century to the present is us, human beings. Yes, there is natural variability. It caused the early 20th century warming, which was about seven-tenths of a degree Celsius, and the mid-20th century cooling. Um, so there are natural variations, but they are not the cause of the warming that we have observed from the mid-19th century. And the climate sensitivity that we get doing that is about two degrees. We've used that uh, to look forward as to what uh, we have to do in order to keep the total global warming, uh, the maximum warming, less than the two degrees Celsius that's been adopted by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change to avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system. And what we have found is good news, actually. Uh, we developed a fair plan to phase out uh, greenhouse gas emissions over an 80-year period starting in 2020 and completing in 2100 and the novel idea here is that we adjust how much uh, the developing countries emit and the developed countries so that the total by each is equal. Why do that? Because it's the developed countries that have put most of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to present date and are therefore responsible for all the climate change that will happen even if we stop putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere right now. And if we were to do that, the atmosphere would warm up in the future as it goes towards equilibrium by as much as it's already warmed, which is about eight tenths of a degree Celsius. But it will be the developing countries, China, India, Brazil, in the future that will be the lion's share of the emissions. And so it, that conundrum has made it difficult to get political agreement to do anything. The U.S. Yeah. Senate years ago voted 100 to 0 to not join the Kyoto Protocol. Why? Because India and China were not included. So this plan allows uh, India and China and Brazil and other developing countries to continue to increase their emission to roughly mid-century and then bring down their emissions to zero. At the end of this century, while the developed, the developed countries are phasing out linearly, basically, over the 80 yeah. years. And so this is what we call a fair plan to safeguard the Earth's climate. It keeps the warming below the two degrees Celsius maximum to avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system. Yeah. One of the things that's been hard for societies, I think, in this is that there's this there's such durable un, um, uncertainty around some of the key questions surrounding climate change, and the, the models that have led us to this basic understanding don't seem to be very good at clarifying things like regional forecasting, like uh, again the sensitivity. There's still a lot of people out there I, I've talked to in the science community who see see a higher result than you do, and I don't know whether you um, have a sense of what. If, what the public should do when they well, see that the climate kind of sensitivity 
were higher than we estimated. Mm -hmm. And really, the estimates based on models, depending on the models, how you treat all of the physical processes that occur on spatial scales that are too small for our supercomputers. And in fact, behind me right. is uh, the world's fastest supercomputer, Blue Waters, that runs uh, a million billion calculations a second. But even that is too slow to resolve all the physical processes. And how you treat, you can't ignore those in these models, and how you treat them determines the climate sensitivity that the model produces. So that's why we use the instrumental observations of temperature change and not a model to back out the climate sensitivity. But if the climate sensitivity were larger than what we've determined, roughly two degrees Celsius or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, then what we have to do is sooner and more rapidly than for the climate sensitivity we've backed out. So this is uh, a hedge, in a way, against the climate sensitivity being larger than our estimate <coughs> of it now. So there's no way that we should uh, do nothing because of you know, recurring uncertainties right. in this problem. And I should tell you what I teach in my class. If, if Earth were an all-land planet and you, you changed the amount of radiation, say, coming from the sun, if you increased it by about us 1.5%, then the, the climate would reach a new equilibrium in 10 years. But because the Earth is 70% ocean, which can move vertically and take the heat away from the surface, the climate comes to equilibrium not in 10 years, not in 100 years, but in 1,000 years. So that means that after we do something to reduce emissions, for example, to mitigate the impacts, it takes a long time before we feel anything, before the right. climate system will notice that. Right. So we don't have the luxury we would if this were an all-land planet. And uh, the sooner we recognize this and begin to uh, treat this problem, the, the better it's going to be. We already see sea level rise. And in fact, it's interesting that North America, the sea level off North America at present is lower than the global average sea level. Why? Because we have the Gulf Stream and the thermohaline circulation. And I won't go into all the physics of that, but when you increase greenhouse gases, you slow down the Gulf Stream and the thermohaline circulation. And the lower than global average sea level height off the, the east coast of North America, and particularly the United States, uh, will rise about twice as much as the global average. So places like Boston, New York, and North Carolina are going to experience larger sea level than other places in the world. So people who argue we don't have to do anything like one of the presidential candidates, uh, this is not correct.